She's making some copies. Yeah. She didn't make enough? Oh, that's interesting. You remember Jan and Dean? Jan and Dean? The little, didn't they sing like the Beach Boys songs? Jan and Dean? You know what I'm talking about? Here comes Jan and, Jan and Dan. It's like Jan and Dean. Do you love me, surfer girl, surfer girl, surfer girl? We're just waiting for Christine's going to bring a few copies, then we'll get fired up here. So, uh, Landon, you didn't catch me singing Surfer Girl by Jan and Dean. Landon's our, I want to give a shout out to Landon for being here all week and streaming these nights. So, Landon, thanks for your streaming. Uh, sometimes I forget about those guys, Landon and Dan, because they're just, they do the job and they do an important job, but they're in a closet up there hidden from view. So, uh, thanks, Landon, for bringing this to everybody who wants to watch it online. So it's our last night. These things go by fast. I always enjoy the heck out of them. And then suddenly, what do I do on Wednesday? You know, it's like there's nothing, there's nothing to do. So um, we will just pass the basket at the end of the talk. Just, uh, I know everybody doesn't carry cash with you, but just give you that opportunity if you would like to support the mission that way. But it's been good. It's been every, every presentation. And uh, thanks for bringing your heart and soul and all your convictions and love of God and Jesus and us. I think you love us. I even Don't you think he loves us? I feel like he does. And to bring that to bear in our week. So uh, with that, come on up and we'll have our last night. Well, I know what I'm going to do tomorrow. I'm going to have a martini. Nothing like a martini, you know? <laughs> 317 West Grand Avenue, Chippewa Falls, 6 o'clock. And if you show up, bring some vodka. Uh, let us take a moment to enter into silence, to open ourselves to the ever-present love of God. We may begin with a prayer on this last evening of our mission. Watch over your people, O Lord God, with unfailing mercy, and since without you, Humankind will surely fall. Protect us by your grace from every harm. And guide us toward those things that work for our good. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. So as we did the last couple of nights, we'll start by just asking if there are any questions Anything you thought about that you would like to bring up? Anything that you thought about and said, that old man is crazy? Um, anybody got any questions, comments? Question yes, oh yes. I, I'd like you to put your email address up there so we can see it. I, I forgot how to do it. I know you said <laughs> Okay. I'll write, it, I'll write it for him. Thank you. Father Tom will take care of that. I have a good secretary. Okay. We're working on getting those on the website. Uh, have the But if, if you want to contact me by email, that'll work. Anything else? Anybody else? Any other thoughts, reflections, ideas? Yes. I don't know why, but it's been it's been bothering me. What exactly 
is poor in spirit. Oh, you're the second person to ask me that. <laughs> poor in spirit is contrasted to people who are really materially poor. They, we, those people we need to work with and we need to help. Poor in spirit means I'm not attached to anything material, that God is first. So, you know, you look around us and we see people who are very wealthy, um, who are addicted to making money. And so what happens? They have no meaningful, loving relationships because it's all about making money, as an example. Make sense? Okay. Poor in spirit means I am detached from that world of material things. Not that they're not important. You know, if I have a fortune, I'm certainly going to take all those trips that I'd love to take. Um, but I'm not addicted to it. Okay? You're welcome. One, two, three. You've had your chance. Um, tonight, we want to look at... at Tonight, I'd like to ask you to try out some of the things that I presented, I've been presenting the last two nights. Particularly, I would like us as, as, as small groups to take a, a gospel passage and reflect on it together. and See what it says to you and to your life and to how you see reality. We'll do that in a, in a, in a minute. Um, but I, as I've said before, you know, I, I, I've gone to lots of workshops and meetings and you hear all kinds of wonderful ideas and then you get home and you say, oh, that was a wonderful thing. How do I do it? Uh, so I'd like to just take part of our time to ask you to experience something, how to reflect on the Word of God. And I hope that you will find it so rewarding that you'll do it every day. That's my hope, anyways. Um, as, and as, uh, just to reiterate, I believe that we find out who Jesus is and how we are to be his disciples by consistent reflection on the word of God. I love this quote from the Hebrew scriptures. It's the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish. Bud and flourish, wonderful words, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. I believe that God speaks his word in order to help us to flourish, to help us to grow, to help us to be happy. You know, I love this Pope because he talks about being happy Christians, not this long faced stuff that, you know, we're, I was taught, you know, you gotta be serious. Well, you gotta be serious, but if you really are in love with God and God is in love with you, where's the joy? You know, you, many of you have uh, spouses. I'm sure there's joy in your marriage. Um, there's joy in your friendships. Well, why shouldn't there be joy with God as well? But I think this, this is important to me because it, it affirms that it's God, it's God who will help me flourish. I have to cooperate, but the initiative is always God. He is so in love with us that he reaches out and grabs us. And as we'll see in the gospel today that we'll be reflecting on, he hugs us so tightly that it hurts. Uh, I have an aunt, I had an aunt, God rest her soul, who thought the, the, the tighter she hugged you, the more you knew he, she loved you. Well, broken back doesn't say very much. <laughs> um, but you understand uh, kind of what I'm saying. So I, I, I think this is this really, I always go back to this because I really, really think it's, it captures what the word of God 
is able to do in our lives uh, because it is God who's acting. The gospel is not intended as a rule of life, but to stimulate imagination and personal responsibility. <clears throat> Some denominations, you know, they, they're literalists, huh? they're fundamentalists. They take every word at its value. But the scriptures tell us the goodness of God, how God looks at us and how we are to look at each other and God in order to, in order to stimulate our imagination. <coughs> Excuse me. St. Ignatius of Loyola, I don't know if you know who he was, founded the Jesuit order. And his method of prayer that he teaches, taught, and still, they still use is, is uh, to take a scripture story, to read it, and to imagine that you're part of it. So if it's the story of Jesus, you know, he's, he's on the lake and the storm comes up and the disciples panic. Join those... Join those disciples. Imagine that you're one of those disciples or be a good observer and see what happens. And the purpose of that is not just to use the imagination, but to be in touch with the feelings. If, are you panicked? Why are you panicked? Christ is right there. He's always taking care of you. Why is he panicked? And the stories reflected upon, call us to personal responsibility for living our following of him in a genuine way. So we don't take it literally. You know, I, somebody asked me a question. I was, I was giving a presentation at St. Anthony's a Marathon. Um, and and it, was, it was a story. Oh, I know what it was. <clears throat> I was talking about the... Uh, the, how in the New Testament we see God's love through all the stories. And he said, well, what about the Hebrew scriptures? What about the Old Testament? I said, do you believe all those stories are literally true? I said, this is the way I see it. The Hebrews had an experience and they got through it and it was successful and they attribute it to God. So the point is not the details of the story, but the point is that God work, works in our lives and that God can help us through those difficult times. So we're, we're not literalists, we're not fundamentalists. We, we see the word of God as symbol. In, in the New Testament, Christ is the face of God and it stimulates our imagination and it calls us to responsibility. At least I think it does. It, it preserves the radical nature of Jesus' message and proposes ways to come to terms with it in the realities of everyday life. You know, one of the things that I think we have to be careful of is domesticating the gospel so that we make it comfortable. None of us want to be uncomfortable. But I think that part of the dynamism of the scriptures is for us to read something and feel a little bit uncomfortable. Maybe it's a story of how Jesus reaches out to the Samaritan woman at the well, which we don't read this year, but we read during, uh, during uh, Lent in year A. Do you remember the story of the of Jesus meeting the Samaritan woman? Yes or no? Yes. You notice what happens. He comes and he comes at the noon hour and she's alone. And she's a Samaritan, enemies of the Jews, heretics. And she was married five times and is living with a man that she's not married to. And what does Jesus do? Does he scold her? Does he shake his finger at her? Say, you wicked woman. What does he do? He 
They ask her for a drink of water. Eventually, what does he do for that woman? He reaches her heart. Yeah. The he, state that she was in at the time was, she was starting to wonder herself. Hang on, no one can hear you. Sorry. <laughs> we want to hear the words of wisdom. Yeah, I repeat that. Sorry. <laughs> no, I was just going to say that um, that Jesus met her and reached her to her heart because she was starting to think and wonder about herself and where she was. And she heard about the Messiah because the Samaritans did at that time. So it was just, um, that was the reason and it helped spread the gospel when Jesus went there to speak with her because then she in turn went back into the city and said some of the things that he told her about herself that no one would really have known except someone who was all-knowing, mm -hmm. you know, who was the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So, Yes, and the, the, so the point is that he changes her heart, that he really... The way he talked to her was with such dignity that she became uh, aware of her goodness. And she goes back into the village, and I believe it's when she gets back to the village that the light goes on. And she says, this is the Messiah. Come with me and let us see. Come and I'll show you the Messiah. Um, so it is this whole idea um, that the gospel is radical, you know, because it is non-conforming. Jesus talks to a Samaritan woman. First of all, talking to a woman in that culture was forbidden. She had to talk. She had to have a man with her. A woman couldn't go anywhere unless she had a man with her. Certainly, no, no Jewish man would speak to her because she was a Samaritan. She was a sinner. If you dealt with sinners in those days, if you were a good Jew, you couldn't go into the synagogue and you couldn't go into the temple until you were cleansed in some way. So you see what he's doing. He's bucking all of those things that oppress people, even in the name of religion. And I think that's why it's important never to make the, the gospel comfortable, to be open to the challenge that it gives us as we, as we try to follow Jesus uh, and do his bidding, if you will. Okay? All right? All right. So we Franciscans talk about the top part. We go from gospel to life, life to gospel. It's a circle. And so I begin to reflect on the gospel. I look at the gospel with, I look at my life with that gospel lens. I go back into my life and I try to live what I've learned. And then I come back to the gospel and ask myself, how have I done in the light of the gospel message? that has touched me. In a, in a moment, we're going to do the activity, and I want you to think about the four basic relationships that we have in our lives. We relate to ourselves, we relate to others, we relate to God, and we relate to creation. Those, I think, are the four relationships that govern our lives. And the question is, how do I live those from a gospel perspective? How do I view myself through the eyes of God? How do I view my neighbor through the eyes of God? How do I understand God? And finally, how do I view creation through the eyes of God? And the third one on our concept of God, we talked about that at the beginning, is crucial. It's very important. 
to, in, our, in each of us in our own minds to try to come to a realization of who God is. For me, for me. Because that governs so much in our spiritual life. When I, when I, I, I do a little spiritual direction, I have a couple of clients who come and see me for spiritual direction. And I always want to begin by discussing that, trying to get the person to talk about their image of God and, and kind of hold it up to them and ask them, what kind of God is this? Is this the ogre God or is this the God of love? Is this the God who's way up in the sky and has nothing to do with us? Or is this the God that's engaged in a meaningful relationship with us? Um, and each of those determines a little bit how we live our lives, I think. This has been my, my observation uh, as I've worked with people over the years. Uh, so those are the four relationships that I want us to look at. Okay, now. Oh, no, I can't show that yet. That's, that's my analysis of the story we're going to be looking at. I would ask you to stand up. I would ask you to look around the room. I would ask you to choose two people that you do not know. So I would ask, therefore, that we form groups of three. OK? Find your partners. And find a place in the church that you can talk without being interrupted. You got a group here? There you go.
Hello. Hello. I'm going to give you 10 minutes to do this. And after 10 minutes, if you need more time, let me know. I only have one left. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I think people are okay.
Hello, boys and girls. Hello. It's hard to get their attention now. <clears throat> Five more minutes? Five? Okay, we'll give you five more. Can I have your attention, please? Hello? Stay where you are for a minute, please. So before we regather, would someone in each group be uh, responsible for reporting back what the group spoke about? So be sure that you appoint someone. And when you've done that, you can come back.
Let's regather, folks, up front. Come up, come up. Just sit for a moment and we'll uh, see. I'm on. Okay. I hope the experience was a good one. Um, if it wasn't, I don't know what to say. But um, let's start here and move to the back. And if you are a spokesman for a group, just give us a general brief summary of what. And you don't have to go through each of the questions, but maybe some highlights, things the group really found interesting or talked about. And Christine will, will, um, will uh, pass the mic. Okay. So one of the things that we discussed is the question of whether or not the one son, after his father pleaded with him about what he had done actually went to the banquet. Ah. Um, but the other part of it was that um, we see ourselves in each one of the actors here in, in the story, right. how we live our life. Uh, that's an interesting comment, the first one you made, because Luke leaves the story, Jesus leaves the story like it is. So we'll ask that question. By the way, um, scholars tell us that this is an authentic story of Jesus. Not that um, Luke didn't, you know, adopt some, adapt some things to his audience, but this is probably the, as the scholars say, ipsissima verba, the actual words of Jesus. So it's kind of an essential story. Uh, we came to the conclusion that um, each one of those aspects of the relationship were within this portion of this gospel message of the prodigal son. Um, we each related to it in our own way, and um, we thought there were attributes that we could uh, learn from and that we could apply to ourselves as well. Thank you. We touched on all of them, but uh, the one, a couple of them that we really hit on was uh, God is always forgiving no matter what we do, no matter how bad it is, he is always forgiving and he still loves us. But we also came to the conclusion that it's still hard not to be jealous in this day <laughs> and age. <laughs> yeah, there is real no, really no guilt in this story. He doesn't um, make his sons, either one, feel guilty for not being what he expects them to be. Next. And we kind of came up with the conclusion that God is love and everyone loves each other and forgives each other and that's what we need to do to all four of those. We also talked a lot about recycling. <laughs> <laughs> about what? <laughs> recycling? Fine. I think that's a good thing to talk about. We had a little trouble 
with the last question about how this relates to creation. And we were wondering if that was in the sense of the physical world, but there wasn't much. Yeah, in the it story is the physical world. About the, the physical world in the story. So that one we had a little trouble with. Uh, maybe the one of the, th just, we've already been touched on a lot of the things we talked about. One of the things we wondered at the end was did the brothers ever reconcile? And as you said, this is left, Jesus right. left it as it was. That's right. Parables, um, the way they're uh, written, they have to be concise. So a lot of details are left out. For example, you don't see the mother at all. Did you ever wonder why there's no mother in the story? We don't know, but that's on purpose. So the number of characters are kept small so that it's easier to tell the story and easier to remember the story. Because these people didn't have any, they didn't write them down. It was all from memory. Next. Well, we talked about um, being forgiving, of course, like everyone else, but also not being judgmental. You know, not, not judging people mm -hmm. or, or situations. Yeah, because we're all sinners, That's you right. know, and who knows why this person or that person is doing something. Right. So. It's easy to judge. It's easy. Next. Uh, we all agreed on a lot of things that were just spoken on, and we also said that everyone has a right to live out their life but you have to be concerned about how to nurture everybody and everything around you. Good, thank you. Anybody else in this section? I think our main theme was return, that, <clears throat> that no matter what, we can always return. Return to God, return to your neighbor, return um, to yourself and return God's creation to what it was before we messed with it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Over here, Kristen. Well, we read the uh, parable out loud and we identified with all the characters in the parable. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of ironic, everything that everybody shared. We spoke about all of that. Yeah. And I think it came down to discipleship, the love of God, and uh, walking our journey and trying to figure out how to be like the Father. Thank you. Couldn't have said it better myself. Back here now. We too put ourselves into each Move other. Move the microphone closer to your mouth. We, too, put ourselves each into each of the characters there, the, the father, the prodigal son, the loyal son, and we came away feeling like we could relate to each one and the anger on the loyal son and the, the judgment. But we also know that we wanted the forgiveness like the prodigal son did and that we have to be like the father who was like God in this situation, that he forgave all of them, loved all of them, and that we too have to learn not to judge and to, to uh, love everyone around us. It's not yes. always easy, but it can be done. Thank you. We pretty much talked about everything that everybody has mentioned. Um, second, third, fourth chances, talking about um, the forgiveness and the love of God. We also had problems with, or had questions about the creation um, questions, so we talked a couple different ways about that. And, oh, when, when we also ended up talking about the two of us had went through the RCIA process and reconciliation and that being new um, as an adult compared to reconciliation as a child. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We kind of looked at it as um, kind of how much the human factor plays a role in our reactions to, to things and how 
God is forgiving no matter what avenue we go down. Um, and the love of God spills out onto us. Um, and a lot of the other things that were mentioned mm -hmm. here as well. So, Thank you. We spent a lot of time on, on the first part and uh, revealing uh, what it reveals about God and being forgiving and, and how the son, the younger son could just come back after doing all that he did and there was just no question of how accepting God was. And then we spent a lot of time talking about how it, it's very easy, I think, for each one of us to identify more with the, the older son in, uh, in society and just... You know, it, it's just sort of natural to have sort of that jealousy, but that uh, this story really provides a nice, you know, if roadmap is the right word, but a, a nice example of, you know, um, what we should be doing. And, uh, and we don't have to just accept that, oh, we're always going to be jealous that, I mean, we, you know, Jesus taught us how we should uh, be acting and treating other people. Thank you. Anybody? Next. We also talked, most everything that we talked about has been, was already said, but when it came to creation, we talked about that they had to um, care for the crops and then and with the crops, they were able to care for their cattle and pigs, etc. And we have to care for the earth and ourselves, yeah. otherwise we will have nothing. Yeah. Exactly. I, I think if, if I ever use this again, I'm going to use the word uh, environment rather than creation. I was in Sue's group and she spoke, but one other thing we talked about was the fact that the son, he did <clears throat> stray away, but how important it was that he realized he was wrong, came back and apologized and asked for forgiveness. Yes. And that's where the self part really comes in, right. to be much more aware of that. Right. I'll do this for you, Mike. <laughs> uh, we spent a lot of time on the last, the last verse. Uh, he was thought to be dead, and then he was alive, which I thought was uh, interesting because he had to think he was dead too in order to be dead, and then he was lost and he was found. I think that's really, we spent a lot of time just talking about just that and the fact that there are people um, one of the things I remember is that's one of the 12 steps is making it right with people in your past, if you can, I guess. And um, if you lost, and then you're found. It's very nice. And I liked it. I'm just going to add a little something to that, too. And I think if, if we're really true to ourselves, everyone has time in their life where they're lost. Yeah. They're, they're on that journey and they think they're going the right direction, then they have to stop and either take stock of themselves or find someone to help them along the way. We, right. we don't do it all by ourselves. Right. right. We help each other on the journeys and I don't know, if we believe and we pray that it, it can work. Mm -hmm. Not when we want to, as, as you mentioned it, but it does eventually. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, do you see a use of this in your own praying with the scriptures? Please don't boost my ego too much. Um, I mean, those four questions were just to get you thinking and, and talking. But if you were to do this on a regular basis, the important thing is to read it reflectively and to be open to what, you, what strikes you, what hits you between the eyes. Sometimes there'll be no question. Other times you'll fall asleep, but that's okay. You know, St. Teresa of Avila said, 
You can even pray on your back when you're sleeping. So uh, I, take a lot of, uh, I take a lot of heart on that. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, <clears throat> when we, as, as this quote said, the word goes out, and if we're paying attention, God is going to touch something in us when that word strikes us. People have said to me over the years, and I think maybe, Father Tom, they've said this to you too, that, Father, you said this in your homily, and one woman told me, and I, I, I don't take much stock in this, but she said, you changed my life. I thought, one little homily changed your life? I don't think so. But anyways, <laughs> then they'll tell me what I said. That's not what I said. <laughs> I don't remember saying it. And what that says to me is that once the word is free, once, you, once I say the word, then it's God's job to take that word and to touch your hearts. Not me, but the action of the spirit, which is why it's so important to pay attention to the readings because it's an opportunity for that spirit to touch us, to guide us, to deepen our relationship with our loving God. I just want to make a couple of final remarks about this story. Um, I didn't make too many comments because I wanted to leave you open. This parable shows us the example of what repentance is. And I want to point out this, that it is the action of the prodigal father. He takes all the initiative. And the prodigal son is so distraught, so in trouble, so down on himself, that that experience moves him. He comes to recognize his weakness, and he's able then and prepared to respond to the Father. Notice the Father. While he was still far off, what does that mean? It could mean that the Father's desire was so strong weeks, months before the Son came. God, his father was so desirous to have his son back. And that's how God looks at us. He's, he's patient. He waits until we're ready. But he's always there, wanting us to embrace us. Notice what happens to the father. What does he do? He runs. A man in this culture with his uh, stature would never run. He would stand at the door of the house and he would wait for the sun to come. It would all be on the part of the sun to show that he's going to change. If you read the story, the father never asks him. Never asks him. Are, have you changed? Are you better now? Have you repented? He never asks that question, does he? He accepts the son immediately, and he embraces him and kisses him, and then he calls for a party. Do you know why he embraces him so, so, so strongly? Because he's afraid, as is the custom, that the boy will fall on his knees and kiss his father's feet. And his father won't do that to him. It's demeaning. He accepts him as he is. He doesn't want him to make gestures that will hurt the boy. These are all cultural things that I, I know you wouldn't know, so that's why I wanted to bring them out. Um, the kiss honors his son and receives him back in the family. That was the sign that the son was received in, 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 into the, into the uh, family. And you notice the son didn't have to do anything. Didn't have to beat his breast. 
Say, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. Very different from the way we do things, isn't it? Somebody's hurt us, we want to know that they have changed. and They're going to reform their lives and they're never going to hurt us again. Father doesn't do that. He doesn't want any guarantee. He just wants his son, whom he loves so deeply. Father is the only one who acts throughout the whole story. Then he leaves the feast and goes out to his older son, and he handles the older son exactly as he did the younger son. He invites him. He doesn't scold him. He doesn't yell at him. He doesn't say, oh, you're embarrassing your father, blah, blah, blah. He simply explains, this son of mine was dead. Now he's alive. Now he's back with us. We have to celebrate. And as I said before, <clears throat> Luke leaves the story of the older son with a big question mark. What will he do? I don't know. I don't know. That's what our imagination might suggest to us in our prayer. What would, would the older son embrace the father, or the father, would the older son be reconciled with the father in the same way as the younger son? That's the question, and I can't answer it. We each have to answer it for ourselves. But in our answer, we reveal something about ourselves. So I think the most important thing is number seven. The parable of the lost son tells us who God is. I remember one time someone coming to confession and they um, confessed some very serious things. And this person said to me, Father, God will never forgive me. I said, well, why did, I said, the sacrament will guarantee that. She said, but I can't believe that, Father. I said, I want you to take up Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son, and I want you to pray with that. I'm convinced that anybody who reads this prayerfully and openly can never find God as an ogre, will always identify God as a God of love. This is an extraordinary story. And it comes from the lips of Jesus. Which is so important, I think. And you know, these stories, I, uh, you know, the, the Pharisees and the scribes, uh, scribes opposed Jesus big time. Hmm? And they're angry because they want people to repent, to change their lives if they want to be forgiven. And the prodigal, son, the prodigal father doesn't ask that. He just asks that we love. That the father loves the son and the son loves the father. There are no requirements of this boy. He's accepted back as he is. I think that's what we need to adopt in our understanding of sin and forgiveness. That it's God who does this. And if this is God, then our mere movement towards that God is going to be forgiveness. I'm not saying we shouldn't use the sacrament. I think we should. But, it, but as I always think, when someone comes into the confessional, I'm just affirming that they're forgiven because they have made that strong movement in response to God's grace and somehow was compelled by God's love to make that confession. I suggested this story because I think it's so powerful, but I think there are so many stories in the scriptures in the New Testament that are equally as powerful. And I encourage you once again to make a practice of reflecting on these gospel stories so that we all may come to understand more fully 
what God is calling us to as we seek to follow him as his disciples. Because we're all his disciples. And the important thing there is we're his disciples. We put ourselves in his hand and he'll take care of us. Amen. I'm done. Now you can go home and have your martini. After. And say, thank God that's over. <laughs> we are just going to pass the basket around first and then uh, close with our song as we've been. So uh, if you're able to defray the cost, that'd be great. Yeah, it truly is a treasure to have the prodigal son in the, in the Bible. Can you imagine if it weren't there, what a, what a loss it would be for us, wouldn't it? Um, Certainly, I was telling Father at coffee when I was a, in my 20s, I had this little mini faith crisis. Is God really loving? And I think God's loving, but does it really say that in the Bible anywhere? And I got the Gospels out and I kept looking for something and I saw nice teachings, but I didn't say, see anywhere where it said, Jesus said, God is loving. And then I came across Luke 15 and the prodigal son, I'm like, God, there it is. There's how Jesus thinks God is. So what a treasure. Not that it's not elsewhere, but it's just been my quick perusing. Yeah. So let's do our, it's number 137. Hopefully we learned it now. We've been playing it with, singing it without piano for three nights. So we're going to really bust it loose if we sing it again, you know, at mass on the weekend, right? We'll know this so well. Um, why don't we, instead of verse 3, we'll skip it, we'll do verse 4. It talks about love of neighbor, love of enemy, just to spice things up and keep it fresh. All right? Lead us, Lord, into the desert. Lead us through the wilderness. Through this journey we will follow. For we see, long to see your face. In this time of sacred struggle, in this time of sacrifice, we rejoice, for we remember what you lead us into life. Gracious God, mercy is your name. Redeeming love, you give your life away. Gracious God, we bless your holy name. Receiving love, we give our lives away. Teach us, Lord, who is our neighbor, is it friend or enemy? When we welcome or condemn them, it is you, oh, let us see. Gracious God, mercy is your name. Redeeming love, you give your life away. Gracious God, we bless your holy name. Receiving love, we give our lives away. And may the beautiful seeds that Father Karate has planted in our hearts grow and give glory to you, O God, that you may bless us always as you do this night. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks, everybody.